It's just gonna add a little boredom to that, and you're done, buddy. You're done. Um, we got we we got our uh, dynamic duo coming up here to lead us in music this morning, and um, uh, thank you, ladies, for doing that. It's greatly appreciated. I think we should open with a word of prayer. Everybody, everybody, comfortable? Everybody warm? <laughs> Anybody want to say anything to Nancy before we begin? No, <laughs> I bet they I bet they've got as much humidity down there as we have, right? By, by the way, continue to pray. Uh, my understanding is that they will be driving back to Maine on Wednesday. If I got that correct, is that correct? I'm not sure. What date? What's the date on Wednesday? The date well, on Wednesday. Well, okay, the 13th. Phil's dad's birthday. Oh, okay. So they won't leave until after that. Oh, okay. I thought she said in her message, I thought she said they were that Wednesday, yeah. but maybe well, I missed it. Was Tuesday. Huh? Is it? I, don't I think know. she said his birthday's Tuesday. Oh, okay. I see. I don't know. Yeah, see what happens when we have birthdays? <laughs> boy, oh, boy. Which, anyway. <laughs> all right. Well, let's, let's, op let's open with prayer because we need all the help we can get, don't we? All right. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for each one here. Father, we thank you for answering our prayers this morning. We've already shared many in Sunday school, and we have a lot of others. Thank you, Lord, for watching over June, and thank you for the Ladies Fellowship. Thank you, Lord, that uh, that Phil and Nancy can be down there with Phil's parents. We pray that that would be um, a blessing to everybody. Give them strength and wisdom, Father, as they uh, as they minister to each other and, and uh Seek to have the needs met, Father. The needs are significant and important. Father, we pray for our online community this morning. For those that can't be here, we pray that our fellowship would be as close as if we're all sitting together in the very same space. For, Father, it is through the work of the Holy Spirit that draws us together. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that teaches us, that convicts us, that guides us, and uh, just gives us an overwhelming sense of your presence, for that's who you are. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning we'll be singing number 630. Please stand. America the Beautiful. It's not hell though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Sometimes we, we pray and we, we get answers to prayers and then we forget to give God the glory for it. Um, Pauline, you're here. That is good news. But we prayed for you on Wednesday night. Pauline has compression fractures or, or fracture or hers. I don't know which. Okay. And I know we have some other people that have dealt with that before. So... We should each be very careful, but I'm glad that you're here. Um, this week, I had the pleasure of joining the the uh, the group that Uncle Ed and Mr. Desjardins are in. Um, I was able to, I, I had the joy of doing some uh, pressure washing or power washing, and uh, next thing I know, I've got these big welts all over me, and apparently it was probably brown tail moth. So I know that both Dick and Ed um, when they take prednisone, I've never taken it before. They both spend time cleaning the closets. So, um, so maybe I should just keep taking it. I got this. I still got a lot to do. Maybe I'll get caught up. But is that true? You right? You know, both of you told me that that you run prednisone, you clean the closet, you clean everything in the house, you clean the closets, and you know you're ready to go. So, uh, but I have to tell you that when uh, that was on Monday night, um, you know, the night before July fourth, and. I, I, for whatever reason, I don't do well with those rashes, and it takes me a long time to get rid of them. 
And so um, I noticed this, and then as soon as I saw what was happening, I put everything away and I zipped over to Convenience MD. And I got there about 15 minutes before they closed, and they gave me some prednisone. And uh, I got home within an hour. Things were 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 much much better. So I was really thankful for that. It was uh, uh, it, it would have been kind of a miserable night, you know, uh, with, without it. But uh, so that was good news. Um, along with that, Janet is feeling better, but not not still up to par. She does okay. She was able to. We were able to go out and celebrate Daniel's birthday last night, but by the time she got home, she was ready for bed. And um, if she talks, she coughs a little bit. So she's not here this morning, but uh, she's doing okay. Um, let's see, what else is going on? I guess there's a lot of other things going on. Any other prayer request or anything anybody wants to share? I know we're still praying. I think Roland may be getting news on a job any day now, but continue to pray for him. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody's been following the movie um, Sound of Freedom. I would highly recommend going to see it. It is troubling, but it is real. Um, it, uh, and it is playing, uh, currently playing at the Auburn Theater. Yes. In Auburn? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I've done a lot of research. I've done a lot of listening to uh, interviews and things like that. With okay. It. The one thing I would have liked to do is stand up in front of everyone and say, uh, it's not just happening in foreign countries. Yes, we are the greatest uh, importer in the United States, but it happens right here in Maine, right here locally. Mm -hmm. um, I have two close people in my circle that were trafficked by their parents. Wow. Marcia? What's the movie called? Sound of Freedom. freedom. Okay. I have a job that's on the 20th, and there are going to be multiple <clears throat> options for me to choose from. Uh, and I need wisdom to know which is the best option. Good. Well, and we will definitely we will definitely pray for that because um, that's how you get the direction you need. There's no question about it. On the twentieth, so remember that. Yeah, and it's in the afternoon in South Portland, so okay. I won't be here at the time. Um, Unfortunately. Well, we need to pray for Nancy to have a different birthday. Then. No, you no. just no. <laughs> She probably likes to skip it. Yeah, yeah. Well, after that, after her trip, she might feel like she's already had a couple of birthdays. I'm sure it's been. It, I'm sure in many ways it's been good, but probably exhausting. I would think. You know, it's it's, it's not an easy thing. Um. Any anybody else? Yeah, I know. Anything else? I thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? No? All right. Well, this morning, this morning I'm going to go into Romans chapter 12. And um, to recap a little bit, if you remember last week we, we talked about praying for wisdom. And uh, on the other end of that, praying for wisdom and getting focused and staying focused. Um, you ever have you ever find that to be difficult? You ever find it a little challenge, you know? And I know if there's disruptions or changes in life, it can be hard to get back on track, or you know, you change the routine and then it throws throws you off. And and so I think this is something that we need to pray for on a regular basis for a lot of different reasons. Um, but anyways, this week I want to build on that a little bit, and I want to build on it with Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 12. And at the time I ended up doing this, I wasn't sure that's where I was going to go, but it just sort of seemed to take on a, a, a direction that hopefully is with what the Lord is leading us to, to, to look at and understand and apply to our lives. But let me just read the first eight verses again. Um, I've, I've actually preached on this quite a lot, but each time it's been a little bit different perspective. And I think there's, a, there's enough depth here that we can we can go over this more than once and still not be... Uh, not be bored with it because Dick Dick is on the verge of going to sleep. So I'm trying to, I don't know if I'm going to let him go or if I'm going to try to keep him awake. I haven't decided yet, but we'll see what happens. First eight verses of uh, Romans chapter 12. Uh, he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in, in proportion to his faith. And if it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So uh, the, the good news is there's a lot there. The, the, the bad news is I'm only going to get through a first the first few verses of it, um, but I'm reading the whole thing because, again, it, it, it all, I, I don't want to cheat you on any of it. There may be some stuff that you may want to go home and look at it and apply after we leave here, and there may be some stuff that comes up that we weren't planning on, which is highly possible. So, um, anyways, uh, verse 1 clearly sets the stage for what our attitude is to be uh, or what our attitude is, is should be going into every single day. Well, why do I say that? And as many times as, I, as I've read that, I've never made that statement about, about verse 1 here. I've never connected it to our attitude. But yet, this time when I read it, it tells me the first thing that jumped out, man, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, that, that to me just jumped out as attitude. My attitude, how am I going to live this day? And the first thing that I thought about in terms of what is it there that's going to impact my attitude is that he reminded me of God's mercy. Now, at the beginning of the day, just out of curiosity, you don't have to raise your hand. We don't have to. We don't have to do an accounting of this. But, but just food for thought. You know, how often do you wake up in the morning and think about God's mercy? How often do you start your day, the, the the beginning of the day, in view of God's mercy? Because if it were not God's mercy, where would you be? If it were not for God's mercy, what would you be doing? What would your world look like? And I got thinking about that, and I'm thinking, boy, oh, boy, this is all about my attitude. If I wake up in the morning and I understand that I am the beneficiary of God's mercy, my whole attitude is now changed. Except if I understand being the beneficiary of God's mercy now, that has set the stage for my whole attitude for the entire day. Because I think of everything different. You know, I might wake up in the morning with something on my mind and thinking, oh, I got to do this today. Or you might wake up on Monday morning and you say, oh, I got to go to work today. Or you might wake up and say, I got to do this. You know, what, whatever the case may be, there may be things you don't want to face. But in view of God's mercy, all of that changes. Like, Man, I am thankful that I have the opportunity to do this today because without God's mercy, it wouldn't even be possible. And I'm like, man, this is a statement about setting the stage for your attitude. Now, Paul had an amazing attitude. He had an amazing level of determination, right? By the way, the better your attitude, the greater your determination, the greater your determination, the greater the experience. I just totally believe that. So I never thought about this in context of attitude. So first he reminds us of God's mercy, and I reference this because without God's mercy, none of what none of what we do would matter. Right? Sometimes I jokingly say it's just like ladies, it's just like doing housework. You do it and then you have to start all over again. Especially after us guys have come in and you know how that works, right? A little bit of prednisone goes a long way. <laughs> Anyways, think about that for a moment. So, now, it's only because of his mercy that we can even have an opportunity for anything in life other than judgment. Without God's mercy, there's one thing on the menu. <laughs> there's a menu of judgment. <laughs> and then there's God's mercy. And God's mercy replaces this menu with a menu that whatever it is that God has called you to do is the opportunity that has risen or may have been made available because you have been a, a recipient of God's mercy. 
that changes the whole value of it. Doesn't that change the perspective of everything that you're able to do on a given day? Wow, without God's mercy, I wouldn't be able to do this. I wouldn't be able to think about it. The, the one menu, just one menu, judgment. Because that's all that's left when you take God's mercy away. That's all that's left is judgment. Wow. This really is about the attitude, isn't it? In view of God's mercy, I see, I, I, I think I see everything differently. I see everything in a very different perspective. Even the things that we may not be excited about now all of a sudden seem a little less daunting. Seem a little bit, maybe maybe not only a little bit more appropriate, maybe, maybe even totally appropriate given God's mercy. And in view of God's mercy, we also think about not only us receiving it, but us sharing it. Oh, man. In the world today, you know, everybody's out to get somebody, right? Well, if, we, if we're out to share God's mercy, isn't that very different than how the world functions? It's exactly the opposite of how the world functions. The world would be a different place if the whole world viewed things in God's mercy. Well, we know that, right? Because we are experiencing some of God's natural judgment because we don't view things in, in light of God's mercy, Right? And God's natural judgment is, is if you do this, this happens. Or I tell people, you jump off the roof, gravity's going to get you. It just will. And that God's laws are like that. There are certain things that if we do them, certain things are going to happen. There's God, I call those God's natural judgment. They're the results of doing things that God does not approve of. But in view of God's mercy, Judgment has been taken off the table, and I've been given the opportunity to do things differently, to see things differently, and to thank God for the answered prayer. You know, I guess I could complain about brown tail moss, or I could thank God that I was able to be taken care of and not have to deal with that for the days ahead. Although yesterday I was a little bit lightheaded and dizzy. I'm not sure what that was all about. I was like, man, this is, I'm supposed to be getting off this stuff. And I said, church will be interesting if I get up over there and everybody's weaving, you know. But it's, you all look pretty stable so far. So I think you're okay. Notice how I put it on you. Like, it's not me, it's you. You all look pretty stable, right? You know, I'm up here bobbly, but you guys look okay. You just, <laughs> in view of God's mercy, everybody looks great. <laughs> Years ago, we went on a cruise. I got back 2 o'clock in the morning, and I used to laugh at Janet about it because Janet never got seasick when we were on the ship. But about five days later, she would get seasick. Yeah. And I used, to, I used to laugh at her, and I said, what is with that? You know, you're off the ship for five days, you get back on land, and you get seasick. And then this one time, we got off the cruise, I got back at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I had to preach. And I got up, and I'm telling you that there were waves going through the conversation. And I don't mean these, either. I mean, it was, you know, and so, and, I, and, and so that was the first time it had happened to me, so I don't pick her on her about that anymore. I'm like... No, I understand that. I'm not on the ship, but the ship is still moving, you know, so kind of funny stuff. Anyway, you still with me, Dick? Oh, yeah. Okay, amen. Good. Good job. Yeah. So anyways, again, it's only because of God's mercy that we're able to do what we're doing. And it, by the way, that's why it matters. You know, I mean, there's nothing worse than spending your life doing things that don't matter or feeling like they don't matter. Have you ever put forth your best, put, put forth your best effort and then feel like, well, what difference does it make? Yeah, we've, we've all done that a time or two. Hopefully not this week, but we'll see. But in view of God's mercy, maybe it does make a difference. Maybe it makes a difference in our attitude just to know that, thank God, I'm able to do it even if I don't see the results. Even if I don't think it's working, I'm still able to do it. Wow, that's something. How much is it worth? I don't know. Until we get to see the eternal value of it later on. So I made a little note that this should keep us humble. It really should, shouldn't it? It should help us remain humble. And it should remind us that it isn't about us. Because that's where we kind of lose sight of God's purpose and God's plan. Now, it does involve us because definitely we're the focus and the beneficiaries of God's mercy, but it isn't about us, it's about him. It reminds us that the right response to God's mercy is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. In view of God's mercy, this is what Paul says. These were not my words because they, they make too much sense. <laughs> 
in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifice. So the right response to God's mercy is to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. So there you go. This now there's the second layer of attitude. Right? You if you're offering yourself, then that's 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 a reflection of your attitude. If you can't do that, well, that also is a reflection of the attitude. And we have to go back, look at these two things together. So it really is all about how we should start our day. In view of God's mercy, we should offer ourselves as living sacrifices rather than, Lord, what is it I got to do today? It's, Lord, what would you have me do today? Lord, how can I serve you today? What would you have me to do today? You see the difference? And it might change your schedule. It might change your stress level. In fact, I, I honestly believe it probably would. But, you know, you can you can experience that. I mean, in conclusion here, I just made a note. We, we are servants. You know, it's the world that we live in, especially in this country where we teach strength and independence and, you know, all of that and, you know, go for the gusto or whatever it is, whatever the words are nowadays. Um, you know, that, that's a foreign statement. To wake up in the morning and say, I'm a servant of the living God. Because we don't use the word servant, do we? It just it's it seems foreign to us. So as a result, I think conceptually it, it, it feels a little bit foreign to us. <coughs> Which is why we need to take the view in view of God's mercy, and then we'll understand that it has a lot much deeper meaning and purpose. So Paul sums it up by calling it your spiritual act of worship. Worship. So wait a minute, if I get up in the morning and in view of God's mercy, I offer myself as a servant, as a living sacrifice, that's that's an act of worship. You started your day by worshiping. Now again, we think of worship in the formal sense. We come here, we sing, we preach, we talk, we do, we 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 we, we pray and do stuff like that. We think of worship. But Paul's talking about this as your spiritual act of worship. You get up in the morning and you offer yourself to God. Lord, here I am, do with me as you may mother of Jesus, right? Isn't that how she responded? May it be as you've said, something along the line like that? Think about that. Now, there's some attitude there, isn't there? A good attitude. Can you do that? Well, the answer is you can. Will you do that? Well, we'll answer that tomorrow morning and the morning after, or maybe even this afternoon. It's your spiritual act of worship. My thought process here was, if you do not possess a servant's attitude, you cannot be an effective servant. That's true. Do as I say, not as I do. Remember, if you are a servant, you don't start the day by keeping score. Now, why do I say that? Because in the world, everything is about keeping score. It's all about, well, where do I stand with this? Or where do I stand with that? Or, you know, so-and-so has upset me. Or where is it? You know, I mean, if you think about it, most of what's going on in one form or another, it, it, instead of God's mercy, it's about keeping score. And keeping score is all about how it's impacted you or how you're being in, how you're being impacted or how you how what you do impacts others. And you know, none of that is really important in view of God's mercy. We don't need to keep score. God happens to already know the score. Right? So I just find that really kind of refreshing, humbling. And I find it to be very, very true, though, that the world is always about keeping score, regardless of what the topic is. Have you noticed that? It happens among families. It happens among uh, co-workers. It happens in schools. It happens in every relationship. It happens in churches in some cases. Keeping score. Hmm. We, we don't need to keep score. So the other thing that, we, that it reminds me of is, you know what? <laughs> What took place yesterday has nothing to do or does absolutely nothing to change the fact that God called you as a servant. 
Because when you were saved, God called you to be his servant. And what happened yesterday does not cancel that. It does nothing to what, what went wrong yesterday or what went right yesterday does absolutely nothing to change the fact that God called you as a servant. And in view of God's mercy, we should offer ourselves as living sacrifices. You say, yeah, but look at my situation. But does God not know your situation? It didn't change your call. There are some things you can count on, and the call to be a servant is one of them. In fact, it's in view of God's mercy that you were able to become a servant. Without the that, you would just find judgment. So when you look at it in the right perspective, it actually looks pretty good. You know, it doesn't only look good, if truth be known, it is good, isn't it? Being God's servant is good. It's the greatest thing you can do. It's why you were created, to love God and to be loved by God. And it works. So he gives us a little bit of advice. This is hard. It's like jumping in the lake and not getting wet. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. You've heard me say before, over and over and over and over again, you learn what you live. You end up conforming to that. Now, it isn't that you intended to learn some of those things. I, I remember several years ago, I wish I, I wish I had a video of it, but we could do it over and over again. But, you, you know, you remember Ty and Nathan? And I'll never forget the day that I saw the two of them stand at the back of the church, walk to the front of the church to take the offering. And young Nathan, who was many years younger than his dad, when I looked at the two of them behind, uh, from behind and watched them walk, they walked exactly the same. How did Nathan, did Nathan wake up in the morning and say, I want to walk like dad? No, but he lived with dad, so he walked like dad. He learned what he lived. Fascinating stuff. Except when it comes to conforming to the pattern of the world. You live in the world, and over time, if you don't take things in view of God's mercy, the next thing you know, you're conforming to the world. Usually, by the way, where it begins first isn't in the area of actions. It's in the area of attitude. So it used to be that there were some things in the world that would offend you and upset you, and now all of a sudden, you don't really think about those things. What's going on? You're conforming. Your attitude is being conformed to the attitude of the world. The things that we deal with today, 10 years ago, you would, you would never have, you, I mean, you, you wouldn't even stop to think about it. And now we're just kind of like, well, what's happening? It's called conformity. It's the pattern of the world. You know, it's interesting that, that, that being a believer, you know, the world doesn't want to conform because the world wants to be free. But what we find is the world is constantly trying to conform people. I mean, actually now, the effort in the social society is to try to make everybody the same. And it turns out that none of us are the same. None of us. Not one of us. Not two of us. Not one of us. Boy, I work on that, don't I? Not the same. And so God in his creativity made us all different. The world in seeking to try to be different is trying to conform everybody. And you're part of that. The world is trying to conform you to fit their idea of what, what everything should be and how everything should be. When God says, oh, no, no, that's not how we do it. We, we make everything unique. We make everything different. We make everything special. And if we allow him, he makes everything perfect and good, according to his will. So I come back to this one. The world keeps going. Right? The world definitely keeps score. The world compares. And I could talk about that one. You know, that that if if you have grandchildren, spend some time teaching them uh, not to compare in the wrong way. <coughs> teach them teach them truths about themselves, but don't let them get caught up in, in comparing because nothing puts any more peer pressure on young children and especially young ladies uh, at, at certain ages than the idea <coughs> of comparing. It is, I mean, so many people have been emotionally devastated 
or made bad decisions because they live in the world and they, they're conforming to the world through the process of comparing. I have to be like so-and-so. I have to act like so-and-so. No, you don't. You definitely don't. So we know that the world keeps score. We know that the world compares. And we also know that the world condemns. Oh, you don't do it my way? Well, I'm done with you. Right? Well, what do you think is going on here? You know, the servant of God is really all about seeing and celebrating God's grace. And there's no need to compare. Because there's no benefits to compare. Because that's the process of conforming to the world or submitting to the world to conform you. See, conforming to the world does one thing. There's one result in conforming to the world. How do we know? There's one clear condition. It's called sinfulness. But there's one clear thing that comes from conforming to the world. I'm going to summarize it in two words. You can write it down. It has always been true since the history of time. It will always be true until the Lord returns. Conforming to the world produces self-centeredness. Always. You conform to the world before you know it, you're going to be a self-centered person. Gotten all about God's mercy. Because we become self-centered. And the more you live for self, I don't know if you've noticed this, you can look at it in your own life or you can look at it as an example, whatever, without being judgmental. But it, it, It's a true statement. The more you live for self, the less you acknowledge God. You know, this is not, that's the, you know, this is one of those cases where I say you can't walk on both sides of the fence. The more you live for self, the less you acknowledge God. So we come right back to that first verse. I, I mean, that one just strikes me over and over again. In view of God's mercy, this is all about attitude. The more I live for myself, the less I, the less I acknowledge God, the less I acknowledge God's mercy in my life that even made this, any of this possible. Wow. And I, I find it challenging. I still find it challenging. I think it probably always will be challenging. But it is true, isn't it? The more you live for self, the less you'll acknowledge God. So to go back to last week, if we pray for wisdom, and if we get and stay focused, then to build on that, then what needs to happen next? Well, Paul's got it right here. To be transformed by the renewing of our minds. To be transformed, to be changed. To be made new, to renew our minds. See, there's a saying in the world that says, um, uh, let me see if I can, uh, it, oh, you, uh, I heard this just recently, and I can't remember, I think it was a political statement by somebody. But in the world, there's this saying that says, I live in their heads rent free. You heard that, right? You've never heard that? No? I live in their heads rent free. And what is that referring to? Well, it refers to the influence or controlling of another person to having the influence or distracting them or controlling them. I live in their head rent-free. It means that they're thinking about me. It means that I'm disturbing them, or it could be any number of things. But just, just think about that process for a minute. I live in their heads rent-free. So um, the problem here is, is that this happens when there's, when, there's, when, when there's conforming taking place or controlling or people trying to conform to one another or people trying to influence. It happens when people are selfish and get their own way. And, you know, this is this is a thing. I, I don't remember where that statement first developed, but it's often used in the political world. So anyways, um, the problem is here in the world is that what I'm talking about is 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 it gets the world gets in your head. And then it quickly goes to your heart. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm talking about the process of conforming. I'm talking about this thing called influence. Influence that, that gradually, without us recognizing it, leads us to conform to the pattern of the world. Because the problem is, is once the world gets in your head, then it gets to your heart. And once it gets to your heart, you've got a problem. And that's what we need to be careful about. That's what Paul is warning about. You get caught up in the world, and what happens? Your priorities change. Do you know anybody that over the years you've seen their priorities change? 
Do you know anybody that used to go to church on a regular basis that now doesn't go to church and their priorities are way different than what they used to be and what they used to say is important is no longer even on the menu? I know a few of those people. Well, what happened? It's right there. And they conformed. The world got in the head. That got to their heart. And now they're living for self and they hardly ever acknowledge God. Even on a Sunday. We can see why this happens. We can see how it happens. <laughs> but how can we keep it from happening? Well, the renewing of our mind. That's how. That's why he's telling us this. So, again, you get caught up in the world and your priorities change and your and, and your, car, your, your course is altered. You take a different course. And you... Next thing you know, you tolerate things that stand against God. That's conforming to the world. When you tolerate things that stand against God, there's some conforming taking place. Because there's a lot of pressure to conform. When that happens, you have changes to your standards. I used to tell people, if you have moving standards, you have no standards at all. Right? Do we have standards? Yeah. As believers, we do. It goes right back to verse 1. In view of God's mercy. Which, by the way, why do I say that again? In view of God's mercy. What is God's mercy? It's the standard. Is it not? Isn't God's mercy the standard for our life? In view of God's mercy, God's mercy is the standard. So when we don't when, when we do conform to the world, when we don't renew our minds, we end up conforming and our standards change. And then as our standards change, we become less merciful. Not to mention we stop viewing God's mercy and then we don't view God. And next thing you know, we, we tolerate things that we would not have tolerated before. Things that we used to say were not okay, now they're now now it looks like, well, I guess that's the way it is. Well, I don't know, is it? Are you conforming? Something here to really, really think about. There's a lot, there's an awful lot to this. So again, verse one in view of God's mercy points to God as the standard. We need to remember that. God is the standard. Because we're always being challenged to conform to the world. And so how do we how do we know if we're conforming? Well, we compare it to God's standard. God is always the standard. God's word is the standard. And that's what we compare everything to. So we know that God is the standard, that God's way is the standard, and anything that sets itself against it is the world standard. Anything that sets itself against it is the world standard. And that's what we're given to go by. So I made a little note here. If you don't want the world running your life, and I almost looked at my writing here and I could have said ruining your life. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's a difference. If you don't want the world ruining your life or running your life, then uh, you need to begin deliberately renewing your mind. If you don't renew your mind, the world will run your life. And we already know where that leads. We've talked about it in many, many, many different ways. So what does that mean to you and I today? Well, number one, it means you need to pray. If you're going to renew your mind, you need to pray. If you're not praying, you can't renew your mind. That's why prayer is so critically important. Number two, it means you need to study. You need to read the scriptures. You need to study. You need to apply what's there. And number three, going all the way back to verse one in attitude, offering ourselves as living sacrifices. Number three, you need to serve. If you're going to renew your mind, you got to do all three of these. You got to pray. You got to study. You got to serve. You got to pray. You got to study. You got to serve. You got to pray. You got to study. You got to serve. If you don't, you won't. Be, if you're not renewing your mind, you'll be conforming to the world, and the world will be running your life. I guess if that's okay with you, that's between you and God. But it's not where any of us really want to be. It's not where any of us are called to be. 
You need to do all three because you cannot sit on a two-legged stool. It doesn't work. Pray, study, and serve. You know, often believers will ask, how do I know what God's will is? A lot of times young believers will ask that, but there are always points where you may even have moments in your life where your life has taken a different direction and you thought you were doing some, you thought something else, things were going to play out differently than they have. And maybe you're asking the question, well, how do I know what God's will is? Well, it's right here. You, you discover and know and understand what God's will is through the process of renewing your mind. That's what he's telling you. You know God's will by renewing your mind. If you renew, if you renew your mind, you will know God's will. How do we know that? Well, that's what Paul writes right here. It's very, very, uh, very, very straightforward. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. So once you've renewed your mind, then you will know God's will. See, it's very systematic. It's very logical. It's very appropriate. It's very easy to understand. So when we, you know, when we when we pray, when we serve, when you know, when we study, we, if we're renewing our minds. When we renew our minds, then through the work of the Holy Spirit and through God's Word and all of those things, then we will be it will be revealed to us. It will be directed to what God's will is for our life. If you don't renew your minds, you're going to lose sight of God's will, and you're back to conforming again. It's one or the other. It's not both. You can't do both at the same time. You can't be conformed to the world and do God's will. Period. Two separate things. Two totally opposite things. Now, uh, I also asked the question here. Um, no, well, number one, let me back up. You know, through that process, God's will is revealed. We know that. Paul says that, and what he's teaching there is true. You will be able to identify as God's will in your life, which includes the situation that you face today. You know, we already had one prayer request. I need to pray for wisdom. What is God's will for me when I do that appointment on the 20th? Does God, does, has that, by the way, has that already been answered? Yeah, God's already written that answer. So what needs to happen next? It, well, it needs to be revealed. You know, the beauty of that is knowing that that's already been answered and you're just waiting for waiting for that answer to be revealed. It takes, to me, it takes away a lot of stress or potential stress. I think that's pretty amazing. I think that's another example of God's mercy. God's like, hey, listen, I, I'm with you on this. He's not going to, you don't go through it alone, right? That's what God's mercy is all about. You know, I know you're going through it, but I'm here with you. I'm here with you. And. Knowing that is also helping renew your mind as you start to face anything that you face, whatever it might be. It's really, really amazing, really appropriate. By the way, does God have a will for every area in your life? Oh, yeah. Well, Lord, you know, I know it's Sunday. What's your will for me, you know? <laughs> Monday I go back to work. Is God's will different in my work life than it is in my Sunday life? Is God... No. God has a will for every area in your life, and sometimes we need to look at each area. Sometimes we do well in some and not so well in others. You know, like going back to the attitude in view of your mercy. Like, whoa. So I listed does God have a will for the physical well being? He does. He absolutely does. Does God have a will for your emotional condition, your emotional well-being? Yeah. Does God have a will for your spiritual? Oh, that's his priority. Because that's the eternal one. God absolutely has a will for your spiritual. But he doesn't want these others to distract from it. See, one of the biggies, right, in conforming to the world, does God have a will for the relationships in the world? Oh, you better believe it. Those are the most distracting, too, I think. Isn't that where you get really intense pressure to conform in the relational side? You know, being in, in some form of a friendship or relationship of any kind, it's almost like it gives people, gives people permission to seek to conform. Have you noticed that? That's why it's so tough. 
we could talk about that, but that would be another message and Dick would be snoring. By the time. <laughs> I just listed here relationals, and, and by that I just cover everything. Spouses, family, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, you name it. They all come with some level of dynamics. They all can be influencing you to conform in some way or the other. And by the way, the more exposure you get, the more conforming pressure you get, right? That's why I talk about focus on things like work. You spend a lot of time at work. And at work, you may not get to make the rules. And some of the rules that are made may not be, may not be very good for you in terms of viewing God's mercy, right? Something to think about. But Paul says very clearly, without, without any doubt whatsoever, he doesn't leave this open to discussion. He says, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. That's it. You will. Because you've renewed your mind. So, um, let me pause here and talk about something called confidence. Switching gears a little bit. But it's really not switching gears as much as it's layering some of your experience and what needs to come in place into place uh, as you renew your mind so that you don't conform. And that has a lot to do with confidence. Do you know that some people, a lot of people, and I think all of us in some area or another, do you know some people really struggle with confidence or really struggle with follow through because they lack confidence? In fact, we could all take our areas of weakness and say, I struggle in this area, and now that I think about it, I struggle in this area because I lack confidence in this area or in my ability in this area. So what are we supposed to do about that? Because that, that could be an area where we're vulnerable, right? It could be an area where we're likely to conform because we lack confidence in that area. And when I talk about confidence, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about pride and arrogance. I'm talking about confidence of knowing that you're in God's will. Do you see the difference? The confidence of knowing you where, knowing that despite th even if things aren't going the way you thought they would be, you, that you're in the center of God's will. And if you have that level of confidence, then that changes everything. That means that you are then able to you are then able to identify and test God's will, and that results when you can identify and test God's will. What my, the words that I wrote here, I don't know any other way to describe it. It results in a godly confidence. What is that? It means that you're accepting that you're a servant of the king. You're a child of the king. It means that you don't control everything. It means, well, maybe you don't control anything. It means, it means God's got you right where I want you. And it's not only going to be okay, it's going to be great. Like we were saying this morning in Sunday school, I said, you know, when when you look through God's eyes and you look over the horizon, all you see is glory. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what you see. I don't know if you saw things this morning that scare you, frustrate you, make you nervous, or make you angry, or disappoint you, or make you tired, or all of the above. But I can tell you what, look at the horizon through God's eyes and you see God's glory everywhere. Created to you, given to you, shared to you in light of his mercy, given to you to enjoy that you might become more like him and experience his glory. You know, that's what heaven's all about. It's about being in the full presence of God's glory. Nothing else taking away from you. Nothing in the background, nothing in the foreground, no obstacles, just pure God's glory. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Boy, that girl is good. She's just, she's, she, she is good. I tell you, she's good. It's, it's always perfect. It's always perfect. Anyways, um, godly confidence. I want you to know, be able to test and know God's will so you can have godly confidence. What does godly confidence do? Well, number one, it helps you sleep at night. Right? Number two, it helps you to reject the things that need to be rejected. Number four, it helps you share God's mercy when you would prefer to share something else. That's not an easy one either. Because conforming to the world, man, you got me, I'm going to get you, you wait. <laughs> right? 
But that's not God's mercy. He didn't do that to us. The uh, godly confidence also, I would say, suggest to you, does this. It gives you the strength to move forward in the midst of bad times. And you all, I want to say unfortunately, but it's really not because it's part of God's plan. But you all know what, what that's like at some point, right? There are times when you need the strength to move forward in, in very difficult or bad times. Mm -hmm. Godly confidence is where you get that kind of strength. The course, to stay the course. When everything in you wants to give up, the godly confidence kicks in and keeps you going in view of God's mercy. You see how it all fits? It gives you the confidence to pray. Have you ever been to a place? I don't feel like praying. I don't want to pray. I can't focus on praying. We talked about it this morning. Praying is hard. But with a godly confidence, it gives you the confidence to pray, even though you don't feel like it. It gives you the confidence to pray when the devil says, never going to happen. And you're like, oh, yes, it is. You'll see. That's godly confidence. You know, um, God spoke all of this into existence. Hear the voice of God. He spoke all of this into existence. Does that not evoke confidence? The God that you're praying to, the God that has, has given you his will for your life, God spoke all of this to, into existence. And all I made a note of here, that when you understand the significance of that, just as a pure statement of truth, God spoke this, look at the earth, out, look at everything that we've got out here, God spoke it into existence. And my thought here was, if you can't bank on that, then you're bankrupt. You see why you can have godly confidence? Through the renewing of your mind? Because we see and experience God's mercy. We see and experience his grace, and we're able to test and do his will. We're able to know. Absolutely know. You know, I'm absolutely confident of this. God poured his mercy out on you, and God did so, so you could serve him. And in serving him, you will more intimately know him. Pray, study serve not to be separated but to be used together like the trinity with no boundaries but all a distinct purpose you'll wake up in the morning knowing that if you that you are in the world but you are not of the world you were part of his kingdom or specifically as jesus said in the lord's prayer out of his kingdom come on earth. Do you see the difference between the two? You wake up in the morning knowing that you are in the world, but you are not of the world, but instead you are his part of his kingdom come here on earth, as it will be in heaven. You're already there. You're already in God's kingdom. You're still here, but you're already there. Do you find a confidence in that? God spoke all of this into existence. Again, if you can't bank on that, you're bankrupt. Because God can speak right now. And he can speak to you. And he can speak to me. In fact, he wants to. And he can tell us what his will is for our life. And he can tell us what we're going to need. And he can direct us. And he may speak it in ways that are different. Or he may guide you, or he may speak it through someone else, or he may speak it through his word, or through prayer time, but God can speak, and when God speaks, yeah, it's just like that. 
when God speaks, everything comes in to the center of his will. When God speaks and the earth is created, that's what he wanted. That should make you very confident. You also need to remember that in view of God's mercy, what does that also mean? It means that you have been set apart. You're in the world, but you're set apart. You know, I've got this one over here. I'm, I'm setting them apart. What, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but it means, number one, because of his word, it means he's going to take care of you. He didn't set you apart to isolate you, to separate you. He set you apart to bless you. Did you understand that? How do I know that? Well, it's what scripture says. It's not like God isn't sorting things. He isn't sorting people. He's setting you apart to experience him through prayer, study, and service. That was the purpose. You know, again, you were set apart, so in an effort to maintain some level of godly confidence versus pride or arrogance, let that truth renew your mind and strengthen your soul. You've been set apart. What, do we, what can we say about this? Well, Paul already said it. He said about his will, because that's what we're trying to get, right? Knowing and being in the center of God's will. So God, so Paul says about his will, he says, it is good, it is perfect, it is pleasing. Can't even imagine any objecting to that. May God give you the confidence that you need to renew your mind and experience the fullness of his glory as it's intended for each and every one. Father, thank you. How great it's going to be when the world has been set aside and we have been set apart to experience you in full. Not in part, but in the whole. Not just in one area of our life, but in every area of our life. And we're reminded today, Father, that through your Son, Lord Jesus, it's your mercy that has been showered upon us. That we might not be living under judgment, but instead we're living in unity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is indeed in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please join us in seeing hymn number 634, My Country Kids of the Earth. singing that and I've been you know hearing some patriotic stuff on the radio um, it's true that also God has set our nation apart and uh, I pray that he keeps us there um, because we've you know we've got some challenges and, I, and I'm optimistic I really really am um, but I would just pray that this week just just remember that when when you have a godly confidence 
um, everything that you face will kind of pale in comparison. When you have a godly confidence, you, you'll be reminded and comforted that, you know, you don't have to worry. You'll be reminded that in all things there is a purpose. And you'll be reminded that even in the things that we face now, ultimately, according to the scripture, God is going to get the glory from that. Everything that's intended for evil, God will use for good. And he will get the glory. I don't know how to find an appropriate confidence any other way or any other reason to look for any other way because that's where it's at, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, make us confident in your love and your ability. Give us the courage and the strength to receive it, to apply it, to live it and to love it. Thank you for your mercy. And may we give you the glory for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay.